afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the inaugural uh, Daksh Constitutional Day Lecture. My name is uh, Harish Narsapa and I'm one of the uh, founders of uh, Daksh. I'll spend two minutes and uh, introduce you to what Daksh does. And then I will uh, also introduce, the, introduce you to the two gentlemen on the stage, although you know, all of us know who they are. Um, Daksh started off trying to find an answer for one question. This happened about six years ago. Started off from drawing room conversations and progress to something we thought we could do. The question was, is and if so, how well is our democracy working? Um, with that purpose, we thought we would focus on three aspects of um, socio-political life. One is politics and the people who engage in that arena. And when I talk about politics, I don't mean just the professional politicians, but others in politics. Um, people's perceptions of elected politicians and uh, development in their constituency and the state. And participation by people to bring about better accountability and uh, governance. So in the last five, six years, we've done a number of things. Um, predominantly, our goal has to be um, has been to develop uh, new methods or methodologies to evaluate performance of elected representatives and government by examining their performance and people's perceptions of that performance. Now, as we all know, on November 26, 1949, our constitution was enacted, heralding a new vision for our country. A vision that was fashioned by some of the finest Indian minds of that time. Um, but today, we are nowhere nearing achieving that vision. In fact, um, it's probably fair to say that we are muddling along as a society. So we thought apart from facing day-to-day -day operational crises as most NGOs and civil society organizations do, we need to also reflect on the larger issues from time to time. And in our country, we know there's no shortage of occasions to do reflections. But um, we thought that, you know, there's nothing more important than 26 November um, to do a reflection because our constitution was enacted on that day. We hope that these constitutional day lectures will generate new ideas that will firstly help people understand the challenges our democracy faces and secondly, develop new ideas to move our democracy forward. For the first lecture, we are lucky to have um, with us uh, two of India's finest minds today, Justice M. N. Venkata Chalaya and Professor Pratap Banu Mehta. Justice M. N. Venkata Chalaya needs no introduction to this audience. He is one of the wisest and most knowledgeable persons we will ever meet, and an inspiration for many of us in Bangalore, who are involved in the legal profession and in civic society. I will only remind everyone that apart from his distinguished service in the judiciary and other national institutions, Justice Venkata Shalaya also served as the chairman of the National Commission that reviewed the working of the Constitution, the only formal body to have ever done so until now. So welcome, sir, to today's lecture. is in our view one of India's finest public intellectuals and has inspired a new generation of intellectual inquiry. His writings on political theory, intellectual history, constitutional law, and I think there's a challenge to many of us lawyers that a non-lawyer writes so well about constitutional law. Indian society and politics have heralded a new approach that breaks away from existing ideas and dogmas. He is currently president of the Center for Policy Research, New Delhi. Um, he has earlier held uh, various academic positions at Harvard, um, NYU Law School, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Um, his areas of research include you know, political theory, constitutional law, society, politics in India, governance, and uh, political economy. He's done extensive public policy work. Um, he's a prolific writer, as most of us know. I think to some extent people in Bangalore are deprived of his um, regular writings because we don't get the Indian Express in Bangalore. 
uh, but I think those of us um, who see the net every day um, see his um, excellent articles. Welcome, Professor Mehta, to the uh, lecture. <laughs> so first, we'll uh, request uh, Pratap to deliver his lecture. Um, following that, we will have uh, Mrs. Vaikta Shalaya's um, comments, and then um, we'll have a question-answer session after that. Um, so without much further ado, Professor Mehta. Title for this lecture, I, I was tempted to say why Bangalore and not Delhi should rule India. Uh, but, I th but I thought that might be actually misunderstood both in Bangalore and Delhi. Uh, it's particularly humbling to be in the presence of Justice Venkat Chalaya. Uh, they don't make many like him on the Supreme Court anymore. I think it has to be said uh, on, 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 on public record. Uh, and particularly, I think, given, given, given this audience, um, uh, some old friends uh, who I know, know a lot more about the themes I'm going to be talking about today uh, than I do. Uh, on this occasion of, I mean, today is in some senses one of those days I think is going to be now marked with a kind of overdetermination of meaning. Uh, 2611, of course, Mumbai, an important day in the history of our constitution. A new political party is being formed in Delhi, which I am going to talk about a little bit uh, 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 later on. Um, and, 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 and some with sort of some policy wonks are thinking the announcement of cash transfers is a kind of new constitutional moment in the history of the Indian welfare state. Uh, how does one tie all of these things uh, together? Uh, a bit reckless, but, but that's what I will actually try and do, because I think, I think in some senses, it is important to sort of see the evolution of our constitutional life in the context uh, of these broader uh, changes in, 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 in state and society. The title I came to this talk, and just a word on that title, which will sort of set the theme for today, was uh, Is India at its kind of progressive moment? With a question mark. And the term progressive moment, of course, derives from analogies with uh, US history. Um, and I will make a lot of sort of analogies and sort of draw contrast with US history. These are meant to be heuristic, aids to thinking, rather than to be taken quite, quite literally. But the debate was sparked off by a claim that is being made quite generally, that you know, what India has been living through in the last five to seven years is India's version of the Gilded Age. Uh, Ashutosh Vashmi and Jayal Sinha made that argument, but many others have made a similar argument. Uh, and Gilded Age meaning simply a society undergoing rapid growth, uh, increasing urbanization, growing middle class, but associated with it, extraordinary rent seeking, uh, a nexus between business and politics that is uh, unprecedented, uh, and really, in a sense, you know, a view of life, which as Mark Twain once put it about the Gilded Age, uh, make all the money uh, you can, uh, uh, dishonestly if you can, and honestly if you must. Right? Uh, as, as a kind of description um, of our times. And the argument that it follows that what followed the Gilded Age in the United States, in a sense, was the kind of progressive movement, the kind of reaction against the excesses of the Gilded Age. Now, at one level, of course, this comparison between India and the United States strikes us as odd. The historical uh, circumstances are very different. The social circumstances are conceptions of national identity. But, you know, if you were taking a, a strictly policy wonkish view, it's not an entirely outrageous comparison. Um, you know, our per capita GDP is roughly around what the United States was about 1880. And I think it is bearing that perspective in mind when we actually talk about uh, our contemporary problems. Because I think often we do forget to ask this question, what kind of state do you expect to have at that per capita of GDP? I'm not an economic determinist, as I'll, I'll, I'll try and argue in a little bit, but I think keeping that sense of what is the right historical frame in mind uh, is important. Now, I want to begin with, in a sense, kind of setting the scene going back to the founding moment and the Constitution we are here to celebrate, and I think most in this room will celebrate this Constitution, uh, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, the sobering fact is 80 to 85 percent of all constitutional transitions fail ours didn't. Uh, that itself is a remarkable historical achievement. 
uh, and his achievement in a sense made possible not just by the text of the document, uh, but the surrounding circumstances and political culture uh, uh, that nurtured and, 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 and sustained it. If you were to ask, I think, most people who engage themselves with the Constitution, what does the Constitution mean to you now? Right? Or how is the Constitution acquired a place in our national life? What sustains it? I suspect you'll get two contrasting answers. One answer, let's call it the idealist one, would be a sort of a made-karite answer the Constitution as some kind of semi-sacred text, uh, the lodestar of our political existence that has given the basic framework, uh, the big, written, underwritten the basic social contract of our society. And the claim on this view is that if only we could recover the constitutional morality that our founding fathers gave us, many of our problems would at least diminish in their intensity, uh, uh, if not be entirely solved. Now the phrase constitutional morality is used a lot these days, uh, including in Supreme Court judgments. And I tried to do some kind of historical digging about you know, how this phrase was used during the Constituent Assembly debates. Um, to my count, I came up with only three references to the phrase constitutional morality. Uh, the most extensive one was made by Ambedkar uh, in the kind of sort of the, one of his final speeches, uh, where there is actually quite an extensive treatment of what he means by constitutional morality. And it's really worth reading that speech, because I think we take it to mean something different than what Ambedkar meant. We take it to mean literally precepts of the Constitution, that there's a text that gives you a morality. He's actually not talking about the text at all, right? He's talking about the underlying sensibility. Uh, an appreciation for plurality, um, the spirit of the Constitution, as it were, that sustains that text. But one element of what he highlighted is what I want to sort of begin with. Uh, when he describes what we mean by constitutional morality, he quotes extensively uh, from George Grote, uh, who was a great 19th century historian of Greek, uh, of Greek political history, uh, sparred with John Stuart Mill on many issues relating to liberty. And Grote described constitutional morality in these words. Constitutional morality is a paramount reverence for the form of the Constitution, enforcing obedience to authority and acting under these forms, combined with the habit of open speech, subject only to particular legal control, right? uh, but, uh, but most importantly, this is the part, unrestrained censor of those authorities as to all their public acts. Right? Now the interesting thing is that the part about constitutional morality, the two parts that Medgar chose to emphasize, was one unrestrained censor of all those acting in the name of public power. And he goes on to say, if you were to describe his definition of democracy, is democracy is really government by discussion. He makes this rather remarkable claim right, that one of the great features of the Indian Constitution is that no part of government or no entity can claim monopoly to representing the people. In that sense, his version of constitutionalism was very anti jacobin uh, in fact, his idea was that the people in that sense, literally, to take a kind of Rousseau's conception, cannot be represented. No institution can stand up and say, we are the sole repositories of what the people need. The conception of what the people want, what the people require, is a conception that emerges through open speech and discussion and debate. And in that sense, Ambedkar's vision of constitutionalism was firmly rooted in, as it were, I think the influence of his teacher, John Dewey, one of the great thinkers of the progressive era to whom I'll return to later. Right? So this is sort of one, one version of the constitution, constitution as, as it were, you know, uh, facilitating a certain kind of democratic experimentalism by consensus. 
What, however, is the practice of our constitutional morality? And I think most people would agree that it is better, best summed up in another picture of ancient constitutionalism, uh, given in Heinrich Meyer's view of uh, Roman constitutionalism, and particularly Caesar's relationship to it, where Meyer writes very powerfully that Caesar was insensitive to political constitutions and the way they, op and the way they operate. He was unable to see them as autonomous entities. He could see them only as instruments in the interplay of forces. Only as instruments in the interplay of forces. He had no feeling for their power, but concerned himself only with what he found useful or troublesome about them. And I think in a sense, the image, the struggle for most of us is that there is the idealist, there's the normative promise of constitutional morality, and there's the reality of using the constitution as a tool by which to knock other people on the head, rather than the constitution as a set of norms which we all internalize and share. And I think the struggle, in a sense, for the soul of Indian politics is which version of constitutionalism will prime. Mind you, the instrumentalist version of constitutionalism can be quite stable. As Adam Jaworski, the political scientist, reminded us many years ago, that often constitutions can be stable not because there is a normative consensus about them, but simply because lots of different forces in society find them convenient instruments in this interplay of forces. Right? To that extent, our constitution has been a huge success. I think it's fragmented power in a way in which has, I think, produced its own stability. So the question is, can we make the transition from, as it were, constitution as simply as an interplay of forces convenient in the hands of some, you know, to, to sort of beat up another. So everybody invokes the constitution, right? Without really, as it were, adhering to what the norms require. Now, a contemporary version of this rather abstract philosophical dilemma is being played out right now in our politics. Um, I think I said this uh, almost a year ago in this very same auditorium, um, uh, and, and I'll just spend a minute kind of repeating it, which is one of the hopes that India is at its own progressive moment, right, comes from the fact that there is, seems to be widespread consensus that the old principles on which the Indian state actually administered the country are on the verge of breaking down or have broken down irrevocably. And this breakdown is all for the good. Right? What were those old principles of the Indian state? The old principles of the state basically that embodied in the, you know, the, 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 the 1935 Government of India Act, which we pretty much took on whole scale, which is that power is organized vertically. You are answerable only to people above you. Power is associated with secrecy, right? The relative asymmetry of information between state and society favors the state, right? The state has wide discretion which is not subject to public reason. The state is centralized, right? And mind you, the first three elements are very key attributes of that centralization. They reinforce each other. So you can exercise discretion because there is secrecy, which in turn produces a centralization which in turn produces forms of vertical uh, uh, accountability, right? And a final principle that by and large the identities of social actors within this polity are relatively simple identities. Either they're simple ethnic identities or they're relatively simple class identities. Now, the revolution that we are undergoing is that it's very clear that no government can hope to run India if it organizes now government on any of these principles. Secrecy is gone, as we are seeing now. And, and by secrecy, I don't mean the RTI kind of secrecy. That's only one element. It's also the generation and production of information about social working. If the government doesn't tell you your air is polluted, some nice NGO in, in Bangalore will tell you that it is, right? That relative sort of uh, uh, shift in power, right? Vertical accountability is gone thanks to the kind of dispersal of power within the institutions of the Indian state and outside 
you know, what Daksh is doing, for example, uh, in some senses, uh, holding legislators to account by examining their records. But you have seen different examples of it, right? CAG, media, all kinds of institutions, right? So that you are no longer in a position where a state official cannot simply say, I have done my bit to be accountable if I, had, if I have satisfied my boss. Which is really, to be honest, how the principle of accountability operated in practice. Right? Centralization, a point that I shall come to, right, is clearly unsustainable right? uh, 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 to, the, to, to, to the degree that the Indian state, uh, in a sense, exercises it. So one of the hopes of this particular moment is what we see as this kind of great angst about corruption is really, in a sense, a reflection of the breakdown of the fundamental principles by which the old state governed us. Right? And the question is, in a sense, what will replace these old principles? Will discretion be replaced by public reason or another form of arbitrariness? Right? Will, in a sense, the fact that the asymmetry of information has shifted lead to more opening, or will it lead to more ham-handed attempts by the state to control and repress information? Right. Will this clamor for participatory governance lead to genuine decentralization, or will the state again find ways of, as it was, subverting this genuine devolution of power that's required? Right. Now, all societies, in some ways, kind of, you know, have gone through versions of this dilemma. I mean, this is a very stylized, ideal type that I'm kind of positing between principles of the old order and principles of the new order. And the question is, what are the preconditions that enable a, let's say, a more successful transition right, to a new order that is based on horizontal accountability, decentralization, uh, open, transparent government, government by public reason in discussion rather than discussion. Rather than, uh, um, uh, rather than arbitrary power, right? And it is, the, it, it, it is in this context that the analogy with the US progressive movement is often sort of invoked, that if we had a progressive movement of the kind that the US got in its revolt the, against the Gilded Age, right, uh, we would be successful. By the way, India is not unique in this dilemma. I mean, you know, I think, as I said, almost every developing country, I know Brazil right now, China, in, in different worst ways, is facing, as it were, the same structural dilemma. And what can we learn from these different successes? Okay. Now, as I said, the old order is collapsing, but the birth of this new order in India is going to be extremely difficult. And I would argue, perhaps more difficult than elsewhere. And what I want to spend the next 10, 10 15 minutes to is kind of explain the reasons why I think it's going to be a bit more difficult. The first reason, paradoxically, is that despite the fact that India is a democracy, India's ruling order is one of the most close ruling orders that any modern democracy has seen. If you have to put it provocatively, or if you take our two national parties, we have one national party which is a kind of quasi-monarchy, legitimized by democratic mandates. You have an, another party which is a quasi-state, uh, sorry, quasi-church, quasi rather, right? Uh, uh, and, and, a, and a pretty dysfunctional church, right? I mean, you have to go back to 1840s France to think of these analogies, right? So a party of a kind of monarchist legitimate order, right? <laughs> and a party of a decaying, corrupt, obnoxious church, right? Those are your two national parties. As with any old legitimist order where there's a party of the monarch and the party of the church, they've been collusion with each other, right? What are they on collusion about? They are in collusion about the fact that they both subscribe to Heinrich Meyer's description of what the constitution means to them. For both, the Constitution is an instrument 